Okay, for the next series of videos, we're going to be discussing sorting algorithms. Um, sorting is a very common problem that comes up in computer science, and there are lots of different ways to sort, and we want to focus on sorting efficiency as well. So we're going to go over multiple algorithms and discuss the efficiency of each one of those. All right. So to start out, since we're going to be doing multiple sorting algorithms, we're going to make a little template uh, to get started. The idea being is we're going to want to collect uh, a series of uh, numbers to sort and we're going to sort them uh, from lowest to highest. Obviously in computer science you could sort any number of different ways and numbers aren't the only things you could sort. You could sort uh, you know, string data alphabetically, all sorts of different things. There's all sorts of different ways, uh, types of data and ways to sort that data. But for our purposes we're going to focus on numeric data and we're going to um, collect the data either from a set of arguments from the command or for, if no arguments are provided we're going to um, collect from standard input and then we're going to sort these items from smallest to greatest okay so we have on our desktop here uh, a file i created called sort template and we're going to be using this for each one of our sorting algorithms so uh, we've got the basic setup of a file here if i uh, just run this by itself we see we're running sort template there so nothing special here um, the first thing we're going to want to do though is we're going to want to take a look at arguments Oops. so in order to get the arguments from a command I uh, can use sys.argv I have to import sys and um, if I just print out sys.argv we can see that the file name itself is included in the argument. So if I type in 23, 54, 65, we see all of these arguments, but we also have this one. We don't really need that one. We're only interested in these arguments. And also notice that these arguments are strings. We want to convert them into uh, float data, floating point decimal data. So what I'm going to do here to start out with is I'll say my args are equal to the arguments from sys.argv, but I'm going to take a slice of that list from one to the end. So that means take a slice from here to the end. And this is my new list, and this list is called args. Okay, and I could print that out. Okay, so that's one way to get uh, your arguments, but that doesn't convert them into uh, floating point decimal numbers. All right. So what we want to do, uh, we want we're going to have this list of unsorted numbers. All right. And if the length of args, so if the length of this list, if that is uh, greater than zero, right? So if it has a value greater than zero, that means we do have arguments that the user provided. And what we want to do is we want to convert all those arguments into floating point decimal data and add them to our list here. Okay. So for each argument in args, so for the arg in args, we're going to convert that argument into a numeric value and set it in the variable x. So x equals the floating point decimal version of that argument. Okay. So for each one of the args, I'm, I'm creating this variable, I'm making this name up, we could call this whatever we want. For each arg in the list, args, we're going to take arg and convert it into a float, floating point decimal, and then store that value in x. Then we're going to say we're going to take our unsorted numbers list right notice it starts out empty but now we can append something we can add something to that list we're going to add that decimal data okay so this basically allows us to uh, convert any of our arguments into decimal data so let's test this out and we'll print out unsorted numbers real quick down here we'll run the program again and see previously we had string data 23 string data 54 string data 65 now we have a list of decimal data 
floating point decimals. Okay, so that works. Well, what if the user doesn't provide any arguments? Well, then we need to collect input uh, from standard input. We need to collect as many values as we can in a loop. All right. So if the length of args is greater than zero, that means they've provided arguments. Otherwise, or else, that means they haven't, which means in this case, we have to collect the data in a loop. So first, we're going to use the input function to get something from the user. And we're going to say, enter a number. And um, blank to quit. Okay, and we'll put a little space here. That's important. It'll make it look nice. All right, so that's going to ask the user for a number. And whenever you use the input function, whatever the user types, and then they press enter, whatever they typed is stored as a string in this variable here, s. Okay. So we want to do this over and over to collect multiple uh, inputs, right? So while the length of s is greater than zero, that means they entered something. If they just press enter by itself without typing a number, the length of s will be zero. It'll be the empty string. So as long as s is not empty, as long as the string is not empty, what we want to do is we want to do the same thing we did up here, right? We want to convert that s into a float, right? And then add it to our unsorted numbers. Dot append and x. All right. So the only problem with this now is as soon as they type something, s is always going to have a length, and so we'll keep doing this over and over and over, and this is an infinite loop. We have to do something to make this loop end at some point. Okay, so what we want to do is collect more information from the user. So I can just copy this and paste. All right, so now I ask the question, enter a number, right? And if they leave it blank, then s will be the empty string, and this, the body of this while loop will have ended. So it goes back to the top and checks this condition. And if they left it blank down here, then the length of s will be 0. 0 is not greater than 0 and will break out of the loop. All right? If they did type something, then we will convert it to a, a floating point decimal. We'll add it to our list and ask again. Convert, add to the list, ask again. Convert, add to the list, ask again, over and over until this condition is false. This condition can only be false if when they're asked this to enter a number, if they leave it blank and just press enter. Okay, So that's the case that's going to break us out of the loop. So at this point, after this code here, unsorted numbers should be a list of data, either data, uh, floating point decimal data, either data from the arguments of the command but if they don't provide any arguments, we'll get the data from standard input. All right, so let's try this out, and we'll print out unsorted list, the unsorted numbers. Okay, so there's our data uh, from arguments. Now let's try it without arguments. And then I press enter to quit. And we have a list of data. Now this just so happens to be sorted. But you see, either case, we're able to get data from the user, either from arguments or from standard input. All right. So we have our unsorted list to start with. So that's, that's a good starting point. We're going to need this for all of our uh, different sorting algorithms. Um, another function that we're going to commonly need is uh, to swap. We're going to need to swap one element in a list for another. Okay, So we can create a function called swap. It's going to take a list as the first item, an index, and then a, another index. So what this is basically going to do is, given a list like this, if I provided this list as the first argument, then the parameter li 
in this function would be holding this list. Then let's say I added the argument zero, which would correspond to this element, and the argument uh, two. So zero, one, and two. That's basically going to say that I want to swap in this list the number 34 for the number 99. Okay, so how can we do that? We can make a temporary variable. This is going to be our list, and we're going to access it index 1. So if index 1 is 0, this is going to evaluate to the number at index 0, to the item in the list at index 0, right? So that would be 34.0 here. So temp is going to be holding that value, 34.0. Then we can say li index 1, and we'll change the value. We're going to now change this value to our other value. So index, oops, li index 2. Okay, so this evaluates to 99, which means we are now setting the item at index 1, right, which if we said, as we said, was 0, we would set that equal to 99. So now at this point, our list would say 99.0, 54.0, and 99.0, right? This is why we had to store this temporary variable, because this temporary variable is holding our 34. We now need to set this last item equal to that temporary variable. So here we say li index 2 equals temp. And that's all there is to a swap. Okay, so we pass in the list. What are the two index values? And then we swap them. So let's let's try this out. Let's take a look and see if, if swap works. Uh, we're gonna say print uh, unsorted numbers, and then we're going to swap uh, unsorted numbers, item at index 0 and the item at index 2, and then we'll print out unsorted numbers again. Okay, so we run this and we'll say um, 55. 22, 88. So 55, 22, and 88 was our list. We wanted to swap out the item at index 0 and the item at index 2. So those numbers should swap. And that's 55 and 88. And sure enough, 88 is now afterwards at the position where 55 was, and 55 is now at the position where 88 was. So this is a swap. And this is going to be common in. Uh, a lot of our sorts. So we went ahead and make it a, made it a function. So that way, anytime you have a, a several lines of code that you're going to execute over and over and over again, it's a good idea to try to make it a function. right? And then you can make sure that that function works properly. We just tested it. And you can use that function over and over. And it saves you lines of code and saves you from making uh, tiny mistakes. right? So this function could have 100 lines in it. and Rather than type out those 100 lines every single time, you just have a function. So this is a function that just takes three lines of code, and you just run that function, and it, you call the function anytime you want to swap something. Alternatively, of course, we could just uh, put in those three lines of code, but that would make our uh, our program more than likely to make it longer. All right, so. Uh, the next thing we're going to need is we're going to have uh, our actual function that's going to actually sort the numbers. Okay, so this is going to vary from algorithm to algorithm. So I'm just going to call this function my sort, and it's going to take in a list of unsorted numbers. And then in each one of these, we're going to uh, probably you know keep track of some amount of work. All right, so we, we want to leave the unsorted numbers alone. I don't want to modify that list. So I'm going to start out with a list sorted and set that equal to list unsorted. Okay, so this is basically just duplicating the list. 
But now I have a separate list here called sorted, and I'm going to modify that one. That way I don't modify this unsorted list. All right, I'm also probably going to want to keep track of work in some fashion. So work is kind of a generic term for uh, how, how much effort, uh, how much computational effort is required for this algorithm. Okay, and this is rather generic. You, you can you can uh, define the work in a lot of different ways. We're going to be something is, is not particularly scientific, um, but we're going to keep track of uh, comparisons and then anytime you swap elements. So each time you compare elements, we're going to add one work to that, and each time we swap an element, we're going to add one work. Okay, so th admittedly, this is a little bit arbitrary because. Uh, it could be that the comparisons take more or less than one, one CPU cycle. Uh, a swap, you know, was probably going to take several CPU cycles because you're reading data, you're storing data into a temporary variable, right? But the point is we're just keeping track of some form of work. We don't have to be exact about it. All right. So we'll start out with work equals zero. And then uh, we'll have some, you know, algorithm. And that will go here. And at the end, we're going to return the sorted list and then the amount of work. So we're going to return two items. Python allows you to do this. It's not much different than returning one item as a list, really. OK, but it lets you uh, return two separate items. And so <clears throat> down here, we're going to call this and we're going to compare our unsorted numbers to our sorted list and that sort of thing and we're going to set everything up down here so basically every time we we have a new sorting algorithm all we really have to do is modify this sort function and then everything down here will be the same all right so what kinds of things do we want down here um, well first we're going to need to uh, get our sorted numbers and our work from our function, my sort. And we're going to pass in the unsorted numbers. All right. Uh, the next thing we might want to do is Python has uh, the ability to sort numbers, and we can verify to see if our sorting al algorithm is actually sorting things properly. Okay, so we're going to make a new list. Uh, based on the unsorted numbers. Okay, so this is basically just duplicating the data, creating a, a, another list with the exact same data in it. And then we're going to, on this list, call Python. Python sorted is the name of the list we call dot sort. And that will sort the list for us. And what we're going to do here now is we're going to compare our sorted numbers to the Python sorted list and see uh, if they're the same. If the two lists have the same elements in the same locations, that means our sort algorithm succeeded. All right. So those are the three main lists we're concerned with. We already got unsorted numbers up here, right, from our arguments or from standard input. So that's where the unsorted numbers comes from. Uh, then we get our sorted numbers based on this algorithm, whatever we decide goes in here. Uh, and it includes our work as well because we return sorted, which is going to be that value, and then work, which will go there. And then we get the Python sorted list. So we've got three lists. So let's print those lists out. Unsorted. And then we'll print. I have a formatted list. One, two, three, four and do unsorted numbers and then we'll duplicate all that and this will be our sorted list this will be our sorted numbers we paste and this is going to be the python sorted list so here we have Python sorted. Okay, so those are our three lists. And um, 
One thing we also might want to check is whether or not the sort succeeded. We can determine if the sort succeeded if our sorted list is uh, the same as the Python sorted list. Right? So we can check for equality. We're not checking to see if it's the exact same list. We're checking to see if the two separate lists have the same elements. Okay, so in Python, you use the double equals operator for that. So uh, if the sorted numbers list equals, double equals, and so this is an equality check, we're, we're actually checking to see if each individual element of the list is the same in the two lists. So if sorted numbers is equal to Python sorted, then I can say sort succeeded. Otherwise, else, sort failed. All right. Uh, what else do we want to say? We, we can print out um, <clears throat> how big of a list we were sorting and the number of units of work it took. So we'll print, I have a formatted string here, uh, the list of length, and this is going to be the length of our unsorted numbers. So a list of length, length of unsorted numbers, required work, units of work to sort. OK, so this will list out. This will tell us how many elements were in our list and how many units of work it took to sort the list. Okay. And then we might want to add uh, time complexity. And we can try to figure out what the time complexity might be. So for example, this might be uh, n squared times log of log of n or something like that. Right? That's just an example, right? So the most of the sorting algorithms are not going to have that time complexity. Uh, but then we'll print out a formatted string. And we'll say the time complexity of this sort is, and then big O and time complexity goes in there. All right, so we'll want to modify this. modify for each algorithm, we'll have to figure out what the time complexity is. We'll try to figure that out each time. Okay, But now, this basically, every time we create one of these sorting algorithms, all we have to do now is modify my sort function. And we'll get, it'll print out the unsorted list, it'll print our sorted version, it'll uh, sort it with Python, and it will compare to see if it succeeded. Right. So it'll do all of this for us. And then this other stuff we don't need anymore. This was started with okay so we can test this out and right now our sort should fail because we're not really sorting anything we have we're just creating another list called sorted and returning it right so our, our sort should fail but we should see all of these uh, things down here that we printed out all right so we've got three numbers here so the unsorted and then we sorted it and the Python sort and it says sort failed and the list of three required zero units of work, right? Because we never added any work to anything, right? But in our algorithm, we will. All right. But this is a nice, uh, nice template for doing any of these, right? And then the time complexity of this sort is big O of n squared times log of n, right? So that's not really going to be uh, one of the time complexities that we find, but that's just an example. All right. So we can use this template for the other sorts. So in the next video, we'll start talking about some of the other sorts.